So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. You may be seated in the presence of God. February of this year, I received a message from my wife and the message just blew me away. She texted me and she simply said, Drew asked to be saved. For those of y'all who don't know Drew, Drew is my son and he's nine years old. She texted and said, Drew asked to be saved. Now, this was on a Tuesday. Nothing special was happening. And she sent a message about nine o'clock in the morning. And she said, Drew asked to be saved. And that blew my mind. I was filled with so many emotions because as a father, that's everything that you wish for. That's everything that you hope for. That's everything that you pray for. And I'm not one of those parents. I never forced the Bible on my kids. I never forced them to read the Bible. The best thing I can do is try to live it the best way I know how to be that real life example. And she texted me and said, Drew asked to be saved. And I was trying to find different words. I had typed out different paragraphs, but nothing fit what I was really feeling. I couldn't explain it. I couldn't put it into words. And I simply just hoarded the message. Because love is a choice. No, no, love is a choice. And I've discovered that if it doesn't involve making a choice, it isn't love. Love only comes about when there is a choice to be made. People ask me all the time, if God didn't want Adam and Eve to eat from the tree, why did he put it in the garden in the first place? He had to put the tree there because he had to give them a choice. If I force you to do something, that's not love at all. That's manipulation. But when you have a choice, I love my wife, so I'm going to choose to do this. I love my kids, so I'm going to choose to do this. Love is a choice. You can't force love. You have to experience it. And even if you don't have a father, you can still experience the love of one. Because I've discovered that any time someone chooses to love you, they're displaying the love of the father. And whether that's through man, woman, or a child. Love is a choice. It's interesting because a woman gives birth to a child. A woman gives birth to a child, but it's the father who determines the sex of a child. A woman gives birth to a child, but it is the father who determines what the child will become. Why? Because a female only has X chromosomes. And a male has X and Y. Why? Because there is nothing like the love of a father. If you give me a few minutes, I'd like to preach a message simply entitled The Loaf. The Loaf. The love of a father. A father is designed to determine. But a lot of people don't understand with determination comes two things. It comes responsibility and it comes accountability. Yeah, we can act like, man, we the man. You hear that? I get to determine what the child's going to become. But with determination comes accountability, and it becomes responsibility. The Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. No, no, to whom much is given, much is required. I've discovered that everybody wants to be the man until it's time to do what the man does or does not do. Because the truth is this. You're not determined. It's not whether you're a man by what you do. It's determined by what you don't do. Paul said, when I was a child, he said, I talk like a child. He said, I thought like a child. He said, I reasoned like a child. He said, but when I became a man, he said, I put those childish things away. And truth be told, it's a lot of men. We want to be the man, but we still want to hold on to childish things. And by childish things, I mean a childish way of thinking. Don't you know that if you think like a child, you will start to behave like one? No, if you think like a child... You will start to behave like one. The Bible says that whatever you think, that is the very thing that you will become. The brain is not even fully developed until the age of 25. So that means if you're thinking like a child, your thinking will always be limited. 
And you'll never be able to think things through. That's what's happening in this text. You know it familiar is the scripture. It's called the prodigal son. The boy is not able to think things through, but it's the love of the father that always comes through. The Bible says that it was a son and he was the youngest. He went to his father one day and told him, look here, give me half of the portion. I want half of the estate. I'm up out of here. The father said, OK. He gave him what belonged to him. The Bible says that he went to a distant country, which lets me know that it's a choice. It's up to us. We choose how close we want to be to the father or not. The Bible says that he went off to a distant country. And it says once he got out there, he blew all his money. Just blew all the money. I don't know what he blew it on. The Bible doesn't say, but it says he did wasteful living. If you got half of a state, you done spent a lot of money. He said it blew it all to the point that he was so broke that he went and found somebody. It says the citizen of that country went and found somebody who resided in that country and said, can I work for you? I read then I'm like, this was the first sellout. Bible says that he sold himself out, that he went to someone and said, hey, can I work for you? The person says, sure. The person says, you can go out to the field. He said, and uh, you can start to feed the pigs. And I've discovered that everyone is inviting you out, but who is inviting you up? Now, you got a lot of people telling you, hey, man, go and come out with your boy. But who in your circle, who do you surround yourself with? Who are your friends that invite you up? Instead, they invite you out to the field. And you will gladly accept, and then you wonder why people are having a field day with you. No, you wonder why people are running all over you. You're wondering why you are ran down. God told Cain this. He said, sin is crouching. So it let me know that sin is in a low place. It's in a low state. He said, sin is crouching and desires to have you. Anytime that you stoop to low levels, what you really do is you even the playing field. Because we start off as children of God. We already have the advantage. But anytime you stoop and anytime you find yourself in low places, what you really do is you even the playing field. The Bible said that he was so hungry that the food, the slop that the pigs were eating, it started to look good to him. That's how far he had fallen. That's how low he was. The food that the pigs were eating, it started to look good to him. And the Bible says that nobody gave him anything. So many times in life, we look to people to do what only God can do. No, no. So many times in life, we look to people to do what only God can do. Nobody is obligated to do anything for you. Your emergency is not other people's emergency. So you shouldn't be frustrated. You can't get mad when they treat it as such. Where you are right now is the direct reflection of choices you made. That ain't nobody else. No, where you are, the state, your condition, your circumstance, your situation, where you are in life right now is a direct reflection of the choices you've made. But if you learn how to make up your mind. Me and my wife talk all the time. I said, we make up everything in our lives but our mind. No, no, we make up our face. We make up our hair. We make up your body. You see these tattoos? We make up our body. We do all these things, but make up our mind. But when a person learns how to make up their mind, no, there's nothing stronger than a made up mind. When a person learns how to make up their mind, the Bible says that the prodigal son, he makes up his mind. He's looking at the people. He say, wait a minute. Now, I know I'm better than this. Sometimes that's all it takes. It don't take no long sermon. It don't take nothing fancy, no long thing that's drawn out. Sometimes it just say, look here, man, I'm better than this. I don't know everything that I'm better than, but I know I'm better than this. He looked at this and said, I'm better than this. The Bible says that he remembered his father. He said, there are servants in my father's house. Servants in my father's house that eat better than this. He said, and here I am about to starve to death. Don't you know pride will starve a man? No, pride will starve, man. The Bible says that pride puffs up. And I've discovered when it, pop, when it puffs up, then you throw up the things of God. That means you forfeit the things of God because you don't have capacity to contain them. Pride will literally starve a man. 
But the Bible says that he got up and he went to his father. The love of the father will always draw you. No, no, the love of the father, it would always draw you. But there's two types of drawing. There's the pulling and the tugging. And then there's the drawing of the shading that doesn't feel good. The outline that doesn't feel good. That's him setting boundaries that doesn't feel good. That's him blotting things out. It doesn't always feel good. God would, God would draw you out of your plan in order to get you into his purpose. No, no, he would literally draw you out of your plan to get you into his purpose. The thing is, is man, you got to get up and go. The Bible says that he got up and he went. He got up and he went. You have to get up and go. You can't just get up and stand there. I always say you can be on the right track, but if you just stand there, you're going to get ran over. No, no, in life, you can literally be on the right track, but if you just stand there, you are going to get ran over. Over, you can't just get up and stand there. A lot of people are laying in ruins. They learned how to get up, but they just stood there. So instead of laying in ruins, all you did now is you're just standing in ruins. All you did was change positions, but you did not change your habitat. And your habitat influences your habits. There's a lot of men that got up and they shook it off. But you stood there. So it just jumped back on you. You got up. You really did. You got up. You handled your business. You did good. You got up. You shook it off, but you stood there. And as a result, it jumped back on you. You changed positions, but you didn't change your environment. The only reason that the pig slop started to look good is because the prodigal son was in a sloppy situation. He was in a sloppy condition. It started to look good. And a lot of us have got up, but we went nowhere. And nothing has changed. Bible says that he got up and he went to his father. And it says while he was still a long way off. While he was still a long way off. The father saw him and was filled with compassion. God sees you. God sees where you're at. He sees what you're going through. He sees what you've been through. He sees what you're about to go through. God sees you even when you are distant. Even when you're out of sight, you're never out of mind. The Bible says that he is so mindful of us. I was reading and a popular phrase came up. It said, time heals all wounds. Time heals all wounds. But that's not true. That's not true. It says time heals all wounds. Time alone doesn't improve anything. No, no, time alone doesn't prove anything. It's intentional work that does. A lot of men feel like they've gone too far and they can't come back. I always wonder how a man could get up and, and walk out on his whole family with his kids. Leave his wife and his kids and just leave. And I discovered when I started talking to those men, they feel they've gone too far. They just camp out where they are. They just reside where they are. They live in guilt. They live in shame. But don't you know you don't have to reside there? You do not have to stay there. But you don't understand, man. I'm a man. I, I, I need a time. I'm really trying to figure this thing out. If you could figure it out, you wouldn't be there. You are never too far to come back. But what you have to do is you have to put in the work. That means you have to do the work. Space and distance never got anybody closer. I cringe a lot of the time when I counsel couples. They tell us we're, we're taking space. We just take distance. There's nothing wrong with taking space, but you have to be doing intentional work while you're taking that space. Space alone and time alone have never made anyone closer. A lot of people walk away talking about, I need time, I need space. And you got the time. And you got the space. But you didn't do the work, so now all that happens is you're just taking up space. They say that absence makes the heart grow fonder. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. But I've also discovered that if you're absent and not doing intentional work, a lot of things that was ugly become fonder. Let you be distanced from your wife for too long. You start looking at the librarian with the hairy legs. Now all of a sudden she, she, she looking good. 
That's what happened with the prodigal son. I'm sure that that pig slop started to look like steak and lobster to him. Because he went without food for so long, he was absent without the food. You have to be intentional. A lot of times, our habits don't line up with our hearts yet. You know, a lot of times, our habits don't line up with our hearts yet. Paul understood this. He said, man, something's going on. He said, when I want to do right, he said, I end up doing wrong. He said, it's some things that I really want to do, he said, but I don't do them. He said, but then the very things that I don't want to do, he said, those are the things that I do. He said, who can help me? No, no, who can help me? Most men don't feel value. I'm going to be honest with you. Most men don't feel value. They feel like their contributions, what they bring to the table is minimized. They feel like it's always overshadowed. Because once you do something, you ain't getting no credit for it. You're supposed to do it. You're the man. No, no, that's what you get. You, you, you're supposed to be doing that. You don't get no hand clap from me, patting you on the back. You the man. And I get that. And I understand that. But it's a good thing as a man to be seen. No, one of the best feelings in the world is to be seen. It's to be seen. When I be helping my wife unload the groceries, if she said, oh, boy, I see you looking strong, I'll go back and get five more sets. I'll go back and get five more sets. The other day, I came out to the shower, she said, oh, boy, I see your hair getting long. I said, what hair? <laughs> oh, th 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 this little thing? No, no, as a man, it's a good feeling to be seen, but it always wasn't like that. No, no, because I can remember a time, I'm big, I always give my wife compliments. I used to tell her, look over, baby, you look so beautiful. And I'm waiting for the compliment back. She just say, thank you. <laughs> I'm looking crazy. I say, you know what? You got it. You got it, big dog. You ain't getting no more compliments from me. I'm, I'm good on that. Sometimes it takes time to be seen. Bible says that while he was a long way off, the father saw him. Even when people don't see you, God always sees you. No, even when people don't see you, God always sees you. Because people can be close to you and not see you. No, people can be close to you and not see you. And this is the thing about men. Men, most men don't go through physically. They go through mentally and they go through spiritually. Those are things you can't see. So a woman, a female, they're looking for an outside sign. But most men are bleeding internally. They're bleeding internally. And most men never open up. They keep it superficial. How you doing? I'm good. How you doing? I'm good. When a man tells you I'm good every time you ask, he's good every time. The last 10 years, he done told you I'm good every time you ask him how you doing. It's superficial. Because most men are afraid to open up. Because if they really peel back the layers, they want to know, if I really tell you what I'm struggling with, if I really tell you what keeps me up at night, if I really reveal to you why I sit outside in the car so long, if I really share those things with you, will you weaponize them and use them against me? But the Bible says no weapon. Formed. Even if that's an opinion that's formed about you, no weapon formed. No weapon formed against you. Those are even the weapons that you form against yourself. Even the doubt, even the unrealistic expectations, the blame that you shoulder, the guilt. That you carry. No weapon formed against you. It shall prosper. The Bible says that when the father saw him. He was filled with compassion. That blew me away. This is your son. Who came up to you randomly. And said hey give me half of everything. Went to a distant country. Then listened to you blew your money. It says when he came back. He wasn't filled with anger. He wasn't filled with rage. He didn't tell you, hey, man, I told you so, you stupid boy. You should have listened to me. The Bible says that he was filled with compassion. The prodigal son was wasteful, but the father was filled. That means God always lacks. God always feels what you lack. He always feels what you lack. That word compassion means he was filled with concern, filled with understanding, filled with empathy. He was filled with love. He saw him and was filled with compassion. That's why I tell people, you got to start seeing yourself the way God sees you. Now, not, not how men see you. I always say men is kind of like biscuits. Men, they flaky. 
So it can't go off how men see you. You have to start viewing yourself how God sees you. Because God's love is unconditional. It's not based off of conditions. And this is the thing, just like the prodigal son, anytime you feel lost, anytime you find yourself in a low place, anytime you find yourself in a dark place, what you have to do is learn how to get into the Father's presence. You got to find your way to the Father's presence. We get invited to birthday parties all the time, right? And they always want to go to this one place, a trampoline park. I hate it. This is a kid's dream. It is a father's nightmare. And I got two young kids. My oldest, she good on her own. But them two young kids, I got I to gotta watch them. And what I find myself doing is at the trampoline park, I position myself at the park where I can see everything. I can see everything. I position myself there. And they got all kind of stuff going. I see my daughter. She over here. She done got stuck in the tunnel. My son over here, he can't climb the wall. So I go over here, I help her through the tunnel. I go over here and I help him on the wall. Then they climb and do some more stuff and they get stuck again. But eventually what they figure out is that I'm there. I'm there. It's not that their situation changed. It's not that their circumstance changed. It's not that their condition changed. But they're able to relax because I'm there. So now anytime they get stuck, they automatically are looking to the Father. That is how we have to be. We have to be able to look to God. God already knows what you have need of. He already knows what you have need of before you even ask. When the prodigal son comes back, he doesn't say nothing. The Bible says that the father runs to him. It says that he puts his arm around him and that he kisses him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. It says that he gave him a hug. He gave him a hug. Do you not understand what the purpose of a hug is? Now, can you come up here? He's my brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He looking shocked. Yeah, you didn't know this was in the script. It's part of the script, baby. Always stay prepared. No, no, no. Research says. Now, act, uh, now act like you love me for this demonstration. I'm going to have to whoop you off stage. No, no, no. Research says that he gave <laughs> Research says that he gave him a hug. But the thing about it is the purpose of a hug, research says this. It says that a hug releases oxytocin. It says it feels and it helps people relax who are lonely, depressed, and isolated. That's what hugs do. That is what a hug is. Boy, I love you, boy. Good job. Mama going to be proud of you, boy. That is what a hug does. He gave him a hug. You can always find out your worth and your value to somebody when you can offer them nothing. No, no, you really find out your worth when you can offer a person nothing. The son could not offer the father nothing. He couldn't even give him back half the estate. I done blew all of it. But it says that he ran to him, threw his arms around him, and gave him a hug. There is nothing that we can offer God but our lives. That's the only thing that we can offer God is our life. The Bible says that we have to be a living sacrifice because he first loved us. Now, because he loved us, we love him. It's nothing like the love of the father. The love of the father, it draws. It sees you. And it covers you. The Bible says that love covers a multitude of sin. Sin is the thing that separates us from God, but it says that love covers that. How? Because you have to understand that the love of the Father is Jesus. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I was thinking about that and referred to Jesus as the bread of heaven. I said he really is the loaf. He really is the love of the Father. By love and kindness have I Drawn me.